Hi, welcome to the Red to Black podcast. Here, you will learn how to invest in highly profitable private businesses to create abundant financial freedom. If this topic interests you, we invite you to subscribe to our channel. This podcast is hosted by Werner Minchel, ex-Marine aviator and current real estate investor, and Mario Parzino, current Marine infantry officer and business investor. Good evening, Mario. How are you doing in the state of Hawaii? Awesome, Warner. It's 82. Got 15 not trade winds uh, out of the northwest. <laughs> that sounds horrible. That's it's really a hor- rough. horrible lifestyle. Rough life. <laughs> so let's get into it. What are we discussing this evening? Okay, the title of this podcast is How Do You Run the Blackjack Table? We've got six topics for discussion tonight. Number one, what does a well placed bet look like? Number two, cash flow knowing when the deck is hot. Number three, when do you walk away from the game? Number four, why are markets obsessed with appreciation? Number five, what happens when appreciation is more important than cash flow? And lastly, number six, how do you become a subject matter expert on the game and its rules? Well, let's get after it, Warner. Start off with topic number one. Okay, so there's two kind of worldviews. One worldview is information, enough information, sufficient information eliminates randomness. And the other worldview is the world's a pretty random place. What are your thoughts on that? I love how you came up with those two worldviews because one worldview where you where you have all the information, that, that worldview means you're in control of your future. There you go. You don't have randomness. There is no randomness. If you have all the information, you've eliminated randomness. You know, you know what's going to occur. Yeah, exactly. And what that means is when you have all the information, you're never going to have 100% of the information to get to get more succinct on what you're saying. You're describing a world where you've created your future with measurable results, action items and timelines. And what does that do for you that that creates a target of where you're going? There will be randomness that pops in since you have that plan. Your, your ability to overcome those obstacles, to deal with those obstacles, you're much more effective at performance if you look at the world. So your thoughts on that? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of clarify that langu- language is that there's hidden information that right now we might not know. And we'll kind of get into this later. We'll kind of understand, we'll kind of categorize information into four buckets and we'll come to that later. But let's just say that I'll accept that there's hidden information and that could make the perception that there's randomness. But if you knew that hidden information, if you knew all the information, you would eliminate randomness. And I'll try to prove that out. Like, let's take a simple coin flip corner. Everyone would say or agree that most likely a, cor- a coin flip has the probability of 50-50. 50% of the time it should land. If we do enough coin flips, it should land heads and tails. Now, could we eliminate randomness? I am going to argue that we could. If we could understand the brain and a thought and the electrons that are sent to your thumb and how much force your thumb, based on those elect- electrical pulses, how much how much force your thumb is going to apply onto the coin? What is the coin? What is the position of the coin sitting on your thumb? How is it interacting with your thumb and your index finger? As you release your thumb with the exact, we know exactly the pressure you're releasing. How is that going to apply? How many flips of the coin is that going to apply in the air? As it lands, it's going to land at this exact angle on a surface. We're going to know exactly the density of that surface. We're going to know exactly how that surface impacts the coin at the exact angle with either heads or tails facing up and what that force is going to, going to uh, produce on the coin. If we had all that information, a coin flip would no longer be random. It'd be predictable. And it's, there's, there's a perception of, re, of randomness based on, our, based on hidden information. Would you agree or disagree with that? So I agree with what you're saying underlying everything. That's right. There, If you look at everything, it's all based on numbers. I mean, they've proven it. Everything you described, you can know that. Here's the challenge. You don't know that. So there's going to be a certain number of randomness until you can get to that level. That doesn't mean you can't stack the deck in your favor. There's a deck. We can. We basically have this game. And we're going to use blackjack tonight as a, as a deck, but there's all these games are being played in society or in the world. There's all sorts of markets and there's these games. And we really want to understand who are the players in the game and what are the rules to that game? And are we going to follow the rules? But let's just take a... So we did a coin flip. 
let's take a, a blackjack table and compare it to a pool table. So a pool table actually has more variables and we could, we, you, you'd say, well, when you break the balls on the initial shot and in pool, it's random. And I would say, no, if we knew exactly what the felt manufacturer, exactly the friction of the ball, exactly the angle it was going to be, exactly what force it was going to strike. If we knew all the data, we would know exactly where all the ball, balls would go. And based on the bumpers, we'd measure the foam thickness of the bumpers. We know the manufacturer, we had all the information on a, on a pool table, we could eliminate randomness. If we, if we knew exactly, again, going back to that electrical single signal, um, even use a right-handed shooter or a left-handed shooter, we would know exactly all the data and we would know it would no longer be random. Okay. Let's take a simpler game. Blackjack. Okay. 52 cards in the deck. Let's say you, you're in North Dakota. So I spent four, four years there. They have an interesting regulation because there's so many native American casinos. They've allowed blackjack to be ubiquitous in all sorts of bars and restaurants and grills. So you can go into all over these like mid-sized cities in North Dakota, Grand Forks, North Dakota, Fargo, and Bismarck, you can go in and find a blackjack table. And if you're if you know what you're looking for, you can find one that has like maybe a four shoe, a four deck shoe, meaning there's only four decks in the shoe. And, and your brain, your brain is capable of processing four decks. You get to six and eight decks, and it's 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 much more difficult. You need to really you need to be doing this full time. And it's a way to it's, it incentivize people to come out, play some cards, have dinner, you know, have a few adult beverages. But let's go into a four deck shoe. So, so counting. So, what you're looking for is a hot deck, and this kind of this kind of ties into the second second point is cash flow and knowing when the deck is hot. So, if you're counting cards, you're looking for um, the deck to be hot, and really the remainder of the shoe. Now, there's ways the dealer is going to burn the shoe. They're going to take cards out to like throw. If they know you're counting cards, the hardest part of counting cards is actually making it pretending like you're not counting cards, and and then being able to win and not get thrown out of the casino or thrown out of the establishment, or or they'll invite you to play another game. That's the polite way of saying like you're not you're too good at you're too good at this game. We don't want you to sit here and take money from us. But yeah, uh, if you look at County cards pretty simple. Uh, you you assign a value of like from two to six. Any card that has two to six, it's a plus one. Any card from seven to nine, it's a zero, and then ten through ace is a negative one. So you keep this running count. So let's say you're a plus ten, and it's a four deck shoe. So there's let's say we're halfway through. So we divide ten by two, two decks left. That's actually a plus five. Let's say let's say we're getting we're jumping in here. And in North Dakota, like the minimum bet was like $2 and the maximum bet was $10. So it's really hard to like make a living, but you can go up, you know, 20, 40, 60 bucks a night, have a good night. Um, and then eventually you'll be asked to play a different game because they know you're too good. They want you to just have fun. They want you to be there. And it's just for entertainment purposes. Um, but you could actually eliminate all the randomness if you knew, again, all the factors that were going into that shuffle. If you knew exactly the force that that dealer was placing on the cards, well, let's, let's say you had brand new card decks and you actually knew the factory, how they produce the cards and how they put them into a deck of cards, right? When you bought a brand new card, a, a deck of cards, and you knew that they took those four packets of cards and the, the order you knew from the factory and you knew exactly the force the dealer was going to place on those and exactly how they were going to be shuffled. And they put, they put in, they put them in the, the shoe you would eliminate, you would know all the, all the cards you would eliminate. If you had all the information, you would eliminate randomness from the card game. There would be no, no more randomness. There's, but there's, there's a perception of randomness because there's hidden knowledge. We don't know the exact order of the cards, but we can start. Sure. Exactly. So as we're counting cards, as we're getting the, a higher number, Again, there's been a lot of two through sixes that have shown up in the deck and we're, let's say a quarter way through the deck, man, it's, it's hot right now. Let's jump in. There's another, there's another point is you don't just sit there in, in North Dakota. You didn't have to sit there. It was such a, such a low population density of the state. You didn't have to sit there and do the minimum bet. You could stand back and watch and just wait until the deck was hot. And you might get some looks from the dealer or looks from some players like, Oh, oh you're going to jump in now. But you just play it off like you were having a conversation. You know, you don't. Again, the hardest part is to pretend like you weren't counting cards. But the deck's hot. That's when you jump in. That's when you know. So, the, so what's the bridge? The bridge is we don't know all the information. It's hidden. But now we're we're starting to look at probabilities. 
the deck is hot. So this ties into our next subject very well because you'll never, in, unless you're God, you'll never know true perfection of how it all works. You just won't. So what do we do as humans? We create probability. So when That's it right. comes to in, investing, for our listeners, where Mario is going with this, it seems kind of long-winded, but it's actually very important because where he's going with this is stacking probability in your favor. And how do you do that? You do that through cash flow. What people will forget is they look at like in the current market with Bitcoin and everything else, they're so focused on appreciation and you're talking about behavioral economics. That is insanity. If you're gonna if you're gonna try and figure out how to say day trade, one percent of the people are successful. And you and I would argue, Mario, that they have insider information. So it's probably it's probably zero percent if you really look at it. So how do you stack the deck in your favor? You're going to that blackjack table in South Dakota. How do you stack that in your favor? Or was it North Dakota? It's North Dakota. They have but both, and uh, definitely Gert, uh, definitely South Dakota. You're all, you're almost on the board. If you went to uh, Dead, Deadwood, South Dakota, you can find some card games. Okay, so it comes down to decisions and outcomes. So let's focus on decisions. A lot of people would say, "Well, here was my outcome," but that tells me nothing about the quality of the decision. So Bitcoin goes up. I bought it. I made money. That doesn't that doesn't necessarily relate to a good decision, and vice versa. You made a bet. And it didn't turn out well. That does has, that has nothing to do with the quality of the decision. The quality of the decision has everything to do with probabilities. We make the best decisions that we can based on all the knowable information. Let me say that again. What our job is, is to make the best decision that we can possibly make for ourselves based on all the knowable information. That kind of leads me into this. There's an old combatant. I'm not going to mention his name. Uh, if people Google this, they'll figure it out. So those highly autistic nephews of mine that are listening you can probably figure out who this is, but it's old combatant. He said, there's no knowns, there's known unknowns, there's unknown knowns, and there's unknown unknowns. So what he meant by that is there's information of known knowns. That's information we know. And then there's known unknowns. That's information we know that we don't know. And then there's unknown knowns. That's information we don't currently know, but we know we could know. It's possible to know that information, but we know that we don't know it right now. And then there's unknown unknowns. That's information we don't know. We don't know that information and we don't know that it's unknowable. So there's those four buckets of information. So where we really try to focus on is we need to know all the knowable information. We need to focus on the known knowns. That's the information we currently have and the known unknowns and then the unknown knowns. Those three, if you could, if you could fill up those buckets and, and really we're getting into now psychology and negotiation do you want do you want to know how you do you want to know how you know the fourth one unknown unknowns information we don't know that is unknowable (laughs) go ahead it's 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 about the quality of your team absolutely absolutely that's going to blow that's going to blow people's minds because because the last one you're talking about is really what's called and and i don't want to get too far off on a topic here because we're we're on cash flow this is fascinating what you're really talking about is people's blind spots because you can't see it it's like in your car you hit the car but you never saw it so is, are you really at fault? You are. You never saw it. Same thing with in- that's right. So if you have, so if you have, if you have ahead. individuals that speak into your life that can see your blind spots, that's the only way to get information that you don't know. That information is all gatherable. It's all dependent on the power of your relationships. Going back to cash flow, tell me what you think about this. I think there's three things when you're talking about probability that you're concerned about with a business. And this is really simplifying it. It's it's the price you pay for it. It's the cash flow. Really two things, but then there's a third factor and then it's your margin of safety. Your margin of safety is, is what takes into account the probabilities of those unknowns that you don't know that are going to come at you. And I've had that personally happen to me in real estate. I, I, so concur. Bigger your mar- I concur totally. Yeah, yeah. So your thoughts on that? I would neck it down to two points. So I would say, how do we improve the quality of our decisions? So we can't, we don't, we're not going to, we're not going to worry about the outcome. We're just going to try to make high quality decisions and let the outcomes take care of themselves. I'd say there's just two factors we focus on. Know the knowable information, know all the knowable information, be a subject matter expert in all the knowable information, and then bet really big when the non-economic biases are in play and the the deck is super hot. Have the courage and confidence because you've put in the work, you've done the work. On the knowable no, the known knowables, all the information that we can know, known knowable information. We've done that work. 
then you push all your chips in minus maybe 20 or 30% of your cash in your pocket. You take, you take your, keep your chips when the deck's hot and you start, you start being very aggressive with your bets. Thoughts on that. So let's get an example on the ground because right now for our listeners, we've, we've given, we've given so much information. Like we've gone down the road of, of in, we're talking about information, right? But then we're also talking about different types of information. Then we're also talking about different aspects of business, cash flow and valuation. Then we're also talking about relationships and knowing information that you don't know. Those are two, three topics we could do full podcasts on. But bring it back to cash flow. What's an example on the ground of picking a solid business in the right environment with a huge margin of safety? Excellent question, Warner. It comes down to processes. It comes down to really checklists. So some practical advice for you. If you wanted to get better at collecting information, come up with a process and a checklist. That's going to create accuracy to properly represent your state of knowledge. So you start off with, I don't know anything about this deal in the Pacific Northwest, but I know that we have a process and I can apply that process to a lot of different businesses. And this is a business that I want to start learning. And when we've done that, we're starting to grind out the work. We're putting in the work. That's our process. And we're still working on our checklist. Even tonight, we worked on our, one, of, one of our checklists together. Is that, is that true? That, that is true. I want to go a little bit deeper. Before you get into the process and the checklist, what are the base metrics you're using that drive that process? And so to, a hint, not a hint, but what are the base metrics that drive in terms of operating margin and valuation because those are going to drive your process and your checklist. Yeah, we go back to our old friend our Oracle. If we can't beat if we can't beat Oracle and Oracle is available to us at a decent price, why why go put in the work in Oregon? Why go up to the Pacific North Northwest and spend all that time? I'm just going to buy a 30% operating margin business, which is Oracle or greater and not put in all that work. So we got two problems. Most of the time Oracle isn't trading at a reasonable reasonable valuation. It's 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 well it's well priced. It's fully priced. And the second one is we have opportunities that we can make we can make money um, in private business deals. You've done that in Gillette, Wyoming. You've done that in Virginia. You've done that in California. I've done that a little bit on the East Coast as well. And to add to add to what you're saying, Mario, because what I've learned in doing real estate, you brought up a, a super like a really powerful point when you talked about the opportunity of that deal might not be there. Now, here's also the thing with Oracle. If the opportunity is not there, Oracle is very straightforward. They're going to pay you a certain dividend and that's it. When you get into a private business deal up in the Pacific Northwest, let's say it's a 20% operating margin business. Well, that's not necessarily going to be worse than Oracle because over the long run, let's say we jump revenues from 5 million to 50 million to 100 million, we are going to absolutely kill it compounding the preferred returns and everything else we're getting off that business because we got such a great deal. So it looks like a 20% operating margin business. That's right. It's not always straightforward in business. That's why there's multiple, you're talking about processes and checklists. It's also about it's, it's taking in multiple things like, okay, it's, it's really what it's looking at is I have a bucket of cash with the opportunity I have right in front of me, where can I make the most money of that cash? Well, if it's Oracle at 30%, the dividend doubles every seven years and that makes the most cash there. Great. Take that opportunity. But if it's the Pacific Northwest and it's 20%, but yet we're growing sales that amount, the returns are astronomical. Absolutely. So it's, it's price we pay also. So yeah, we want to have really good underlying economics. And if we have an excellent price and we can expand the brand, we can expand the reach, you can get insane returns. Um, let's move on to the topic number three. When do you walk away from the game? You have some interesting insights about Bitcoin and tying that into the tulip bubble, bu- bubble uh, that happened, I think, in the 1600s. Yeah. So I, I did some research. I, I've been, I have multiple books on my Kindle and there's a book called The Age of Anomaly. And subtitle is Spotting of Storms in a Sea of Financial Uncertainty by Andrei Polgar. And he talks about the tulip bulb craze which happened in the Netherlands in the 17th century. So how, how did this all start in the Netherlands? You have to understand how the Netherlands, you have to understand the environment. 
the environment in the Netherlands was their resource dependent country. They didn't really have a lot of their own natural resources. At the time, there was a really wealthy class and there was a lot of very poor people. And those poor people were very hard working and thrifty, yet they were coming against high rents and high prices. So they were basically working every day just to get by. Whereas the rich were speculating in tulips. And how did the tulip bulbs get to the Netherlands? They were brought by the Ottomans when the Ottomans conquered that area of the world. How did it all start off? Well, they had about 12 available tulip bulbs, if you can believe it, called Semper Augustus tulip bulbs. From Caesar. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we can, we can draw. The Romans, yeah. So the Romans had some pretty nice gardens. <laughs> they, if you go visit Rome today, it's an amazing uh, Roman gardens out, outside oh, it's, of Yeah, Rome. it's phenomenal. I mean, they pioneered aqueduct. I mean, all they were... I mean, what the Romans pioneer was amazing. That's a whole nother podcast. So what it's not just shotguns and pizzas folks. Oh, it's, it's, yeah, we're going, we're going deep here. It's <laughs> to be honest with you, the listeners that are listening, there's so much information in my head and Mario's head. It's like, we're restraining ourselves right now from just, just splurging on everything where we're showing restraint. So basically going back to the tulip bulb scenario, what, the most important thing to understand is what is the currency at the time? It was the Dutch guilder. That Dutch guilder, one guilder is what a high skilled laborer made in a day. So think of it like a Finnish carpenter or a general contractor. They typically make in LA $250 to $400 a day. They can even make $800 a day in higher end markets. So one, do- one guilder was the equivalent of like a high skilled laborer. The Stuivers, I'm, I'm probably butchering that name. It was the the currency below the guild, and there was 20 Stuivers in one guild, guilder. The less skilled laborers, they would make eight Stuivers a day, and that could buy one, uh, one 12 pound of bread. And this is all important as you see the escalation of prices. So as the, the rich, as I said before, it was a resource dependent resource dependent country they didn't have a lot of their own resource they also didn't have a lot of entertainment so their main form of ever entertainment was gardening so that's why the tulip bulb was was so highly prized because it's like you know when you have so much money and you have your house you have your back in the day your coach buggy horse whatever now it's like well what how am i going to show off it was the tulip bulb so one tulip bulb in 1623 Costed twelve Dutch guilders. By the next summer, okay. Pa- pause. Yeah, go one, ahead. Pause. I want to. I want to. I want to. I'm going to make sure I have this yeah. right. One guilder is one day's paid for like a skilled carpenter. Yeah, exactly. Is that correct? Exactly. Okay. Sixteen twenty three. A p- tulip bulb sold for twelve days worth of labor. Exactly. So let's just make that simple. Let's say a hundred dollar. Hundred. Let's see. You make. Um, Two hundred dollars a day. What's a, what's a skilled labor go for? Uh, right now? It, it depends. A day? It's anywhere from two fifty to eight hundred. It just depends on what what market. Whether they're in the mid city, I'm offering mid city prices or Beverly Hills prices. It's completely dependent. Okay, I'm just going to make it simple math and cool. say that you're making that is worth your twelve guilders in sixteen twenty three. A tulip bulb is roughly worth okay. one thousand yeah, dollars. I'll go for that. You're just high okay. high end labor. Skilled labor, okay. Finish carpenter, high end finish carpenter. 1623, 12 guilders equals $1,000. Okay, keep going. Okay, so by the end of the next summer, so 1624, the Dutch guilder, the price of one of those tulip bulbs was two to 3,000 guilders. So it jumped almost threefold, between two and threefold. That's insane inflation, those prices. It just shows you the mania of behavior when it gets out of whack. So by the end of the, by 1637, there was, they were worth $10,000. Now here's the key. No, 10,000 guilders. Sorry, it's 10,000 guilders. Which would be, exactly. which would be 100,000? 10,000 guilders. What that was equivalent to was equivalent to a hundred years of a low skill laborer's wages or 40 years of a high skill laborer's wages. Take them 40 years to make that or a hundred years. Now where it gets crazy is those were so 
highly valued saga of this story is the fact that the middle class started getting involved. It was the, the weavers. They had their own weaving machines that they were using as collateral against the debt to purchase lower level tulips that were usually worthless. So the high end tulip bulbs are so crazy that the lower mid skill laborers who were, remember, they were frugal and they were hard working. So that means they didn't get involved with stuff, but they got so involved with the mania of it that the lower tulip bulbs are getting priced so high that they were leveraging their machines to basically buy these tulip bulbs. And then in 1637, it all crashed. And the author came up with four anomalies. He said prices went past 100 years of labor of, of a low-skilled labor, which I discussed. Low-grade tool bulbs became valuable, and it sucked in the bottom class. Class, The average Joe came in, into the speculative market, and people used debt to speculate. Does that remind you of anything we're dealing with today, Mario? Uh, let me see here. Uh, digital currencies. Exactly. Let me go back to the math equation because I want people to, see, to hear this. So in 1623, one guilder we, is one day pay for skilled labor. We put, said they could make, uh, it was, a tool bulb was selling for 12, 12 guilders, which is $1,000, 12 guilders. If you take in, in 1637. No, it's selling for 1,200 guilders. 1,200 guilders. Guilder. One guilder was, a, was the daily wage for a high skilled. It was 1,200 times. 1,200 guilders. And then two to three thousand the next summer, and then ten thousand by the end of sixteen. I think it was sixteen thirty-seven. Okay, so it's real simple. It's ten thousand days worth of labor. You're paying ten thousand days worth of labor. So let's go back to that carpenter in L.A. What's the price of a carpenter in L.A. right now? Uh, I would guess if you're dealing with a real high end, let's just say four hundred dollars a day or more, fifty dollars an hour. That's the, okay. So the the t in nineteen in sixteen thirty-seven. So we have 10,000 guilders. The price went from 1,200 guilders to 10,000 guilders. It was $4 million for the nicest tulip bulb. People were paying $4 million yeah. for a tulip bulb because it was based on speculation. They thought, well, there'd be a greater fool that'll pay $6 million for it. So it's a good investment. I can make, I can pick up $2 million here. I'll buy this one and I'll flip it to another guy that'll pay me $6 million. I'll put four into this and I get two. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's appreciation. We got into we got into mania because of appreciation, not cash flow. What is it going to do if I hold this tulip? Okay, but continue. Warner, this is fascinating. Actually, continue. that's that's the end of the story. So that's it, it. Basically, it cratered and crashed. And if you look at most, well, you were saying oh, you were ahead. saying there was four takeaways. You were saying the author came up with oh yeah, four prices were the prices went past a hundred years of labor for low skilled. The low grade. That here's the thing: the low grade tulip bulbs that were like worthless. I mean, you're talking about a regular yellow or red tulip, were worthless. They were selling, and he didn't say the prices at which they were selling. They got sucked up in this all, and it tells you that borrowed money for their, for their machines, right? And their day's wage, labor, I think they were paying, getting paid, the, the, the weavers were getting paid like 20 guilders a day, but they had to leverage their machines to get into the debt market to buy these worthless tulip bulbs. And the whole point behind that is, is that these, you got to understand the psychology. They were thrifty and hardworking, yet somehow they got sucked into this, into this market. Right. That's, that's the key takeaways. They were thrifty and hardworking and they got sucked into this market. So their common sense went out the window when they saw the mania, not everyone, but the ones that did, it went out the window, and then at the end, they all got smoked. Yeah, because this, 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 when this the is whole a, thing crashed. This is, a, this is a thing of human nature: is that we we don't want to miss out on the good times. It's a fear of missing out, right? They're they're obsessed with this appreciation. These tulip bulbs are appreciating. They're watching everybody else get wealthy, and they're going, "Well, I know." That even even the rational people are like, "Well, I know this is a bubble, but I could just get in and out and make a little bit of money. Like I'm just getting in and out of this thing." I'm going to buy some tulip bulbs, whether I got the low quality ones, the mid grades or the high end, like the wealthy were probably gambling with the high end tulip bulbs, the middle class. They're not, I guess it was carved out in 1623 in the Netherlands. Fascinating war. And then. So why are they obsessed with appreciation? Keep going to that. That Let's get into that deeper. 
well, they forgot, Warner, they forgot the number one thing is that if I'm going to buy this asset, it's need, need, they need, it, this asset needs to throw off a drip. I, mean, I need a drip for me to hold this asset. And they, they, they threw that out the window. They just said, well, let's, let's focus on the appreciation. And we'll, we'll worry about the cash flow later. Yeah, it's looking good. They're, they're basically what's happening. It's a human nature to look good, to look, to look apart, and they forget they forget about performance. Because when you have performance, when you have underlying performance of an asset, like we talked about before, cash flow, you'll look good consistently until the end. You don't have to look good. You can look good or bad. You can do whatever you want. If you start focusing on looking good materially and you forget about the performance piece, that's what, that's what the appreciation game is all about. It's all about looking good. I have money. I have the Lambo. I have the cars. Whatever it is, it's some ego thing. And that's when your ego takes over and you go on this appreciation route about looking good, you forget about performance, which is the bedrock of value investing and solid foundational business. And if you look at the investors out there today that are involved in value investing, there's a handful like Howard Marks, Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger, and a few of the others that you know. I can't name many, man. What about you? What are your thoughts on that? You, you brought up some really interesting points about human nature and ego, Warner. Uh, the ego drives a lot of our decision-making process. So if we go back to that checklist and that process, hopefully that's eliminating ego. There's still some ego, definitely in our world, in our space. You go to Jackson Hole, there's ego. There's, there, it's hard for people to not talk about how good of a deal they got on something. It's hard to not brag about your book of business. It takes an incredible amount of discipline to just shut your mouth. So even the highly disciplined people, Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger, Howard Marks, they've written entire libraries worth of letters and memos and books describing exactly how they got to where they got in life. I don't think all the, those gentlemen don't have big egos. You know, they're not, they're not driving Lamborghinis down to Miami, but they still, which is, in, which is interesting. So look at like, look at Jeffrey Gunlock. Look at Howard Marks, look at Warren Buffett, look at Charlie Munger. Huh. Why are they not why are they not showy why not showy? Why are they not showing off their wealth? That's an interesting point. I think a lot of these gentlemen do it for the love of the game. They just love the game. At, at a certain point. Exactly. You've removed you've removed any necessity to keep moving the needle. You're good. You're fine. You're, you're financially you've established generational wealth. You're good. I think they really love the game. They love the process, and I think they love the relationships. I think they have some very deep relationships in the game. Yeah, and and, and you 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 bring up it goes back it goes back to the core of what you and I always talk about. Why everyone gets caught up in appreciation? It goes back to what underpins the processes and the checklists, which is your core fundamental investing values. What's my profit margin? What type of brand of business I'm, am I going after? What spaces am I looking at? Do I understand it? These guys time and time out, it's one thing you and I talk about that all successful people talk about is consistency and persistency. And you can hear it from Jeff Grimlock, you hear it from Warren Buffett. Do these guys make mistakes when they get big? Yeah, they can, their egos can get them, get them in trouble. But at their core, 99% of the time, they are doing the exact same thing they did from day one, with the exception of Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett was buying companies so cheap. And you talked to me about how Charlie Munger came in and said, hey, Warren, you can buy them cheap. Let's also, let's also improve that operating margin. Thoughts on that? Yeah he, really, yeah, he really encouraged his close friend. They grew up in, I think Charlie Munger actually worked for Warren Buffett's grandfather in a grocery store. So they grew up in, in Omaha, Nebraska together. But Charlie eventually got the ear of, Warren Buffett and said, Hey, listen, there's a better way to do this. Instead of just going buying these ridiculously company, ridiculously cheap companies, regardless of the quality of the underlying economics, Warren Buffett was just buying them at like one times earnings. And he's like, well, <laughs> and there's so much sad. working capital in the business. He's like, well, I, I don't, I don't really care. This okay, it's a, it's a garbage can. I, I'm, I'm notionally speaking here. Like it just makes garbage cans. It makes aluminum garbage cans. Like the underlying economics of that business are pretty miserable, but he was buying them at a one times earning. And he actually did this in like the nineties or the two thousands. He went into South Korea. Like he, 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 he fell back. Now he did it with just like, you know, like pocket change for Warren Buffett, but he actually went into South Korea 
in the late nineties or the two thousands. And he started buying up like flower manufacturing company. I mean, just like zero margin, profit margin, but he's buying them at like 0.5 years worth of operating income. Um, you know, working capital, three years worth of working. I mean, just ridiculously cheap. So he, he, it was really hard for him to always to put that away. But Charlie was more of his influence of moving him into better businesses. But I want to talk about the Pacific Northwest and kind of our process, our checklist of becoming subject matter experts on that business. And we're putting in the work order. That's the most important process is you got to do the work. Gentlemen, you got to do the work. This game is not for you if you're lazy. You got to do the nug work. You got to dig out and read all the reports. You got to read all the letters. You got to read all the white papers, all the knowable information. If you're not fascinating with knowing the business, go find another game that fascinates you. Um, but what we're discovering in this process is that the information that we want is often tied into a negotiation. It's a conversation. It's a relationship. What are your thoughts about information and negotiation? Well, information... Going along the topic that we're st- talking about right now, why are markets obsessed with appreciation is because they don't understand what you just described, which is knowing the underlying fundamentals performance of the business, and that's going to drive your negotiation and your information. If you don't know that, you're just negotiating on bravado. What, what are you negotiating? Because negotiating is all based. That's right. When you negotiate a deal – you're the most important and really good investors understand that's the most important thing you will ever do in buying any asset is the price for which you pay for it. And people do not understand that's that. Right. When we were, when we buy properties, she really does the underwriting, the hard analysis to look at how much we're going to make, how much we return on our cash flow, what's our margin of safety. And how much money are we required to put in to increase those rents? If you don't know those numbers, whether it's in real estate or in another business, you you have no business buying that business because you can't evaluate it. What are your thoughts on that, Mario? I just want to clarify to listeners: you're you're also doing some heavy lifting on the construction side and under understanding exactly the value add for that property, exactly what type of labor and materials are going to be needed to increase the cash flow. So she's looking at the books. She's doing the historical records on the books and doing a due diligence on the cash flows of the books, the finances, and you're looking at financing the, structure, financing structure also for the investors. Yeah, I just want to make that clarification. Um, also, I think we need to kind of tighten up our language with the right price uh, to pay. I, I want to say that success in investing doesn't come from buying good things necessarily. It comes from buying things at the right price. So we talked about Warren Buffett buying these companies. Yeah, you you want to you want to buy good companies, but you don't want to overpay. A, a, a great company can be a miserable investment if you overpay. Thoughts on that? Yeah, no, those are those are excellent thoughts because here's why. In in one of our first podcasts, I think it was podcast number one, we talked about how do you multiply generational wealth. If you want to multiply wealth faster than anyone else you want to look at the business that's performing the best and that's what people forget is a business that's performing is a business that's producing producing cash flow i don't care i don't care if the investors are happy or not they're all going to be happy at the end of the day if if you're producing solid cash flow but at the end of the day the performance metrics that you know you're in a high profit margin business which is a high performance business is they generate cash hand over fist. They generate so much cash and then they have a smart management team that takes the next step, which is investing the cash and protecting the cash. Those three steps we talked about before, making it, investing it, and protecting it. Those are the essential pieces. So if you don't understand the underlying fundamentals of a business, which has to do with accounting, it's really simple. How much am I making? What are my expenses? What's left over? The bigger Delta is a much better performing business. Your thoughts on that? I concur, Warner. You want to find businesses with excellent underlying economics and you want to pay a fair price for them. That's the two keys. So we want to find really good underlying economics and we don't want to overpay for that performance. 
Um, I also want to say that you don't want to play every hand, every opportunity that's dealt to you. You want to walk away from the majority of deals. You basically wait till you have a very good opportunity. You, you can, you, you can run the probabilities. You've known that, you know, the knowable information, you know, all the knowable information you've run the probabilities. And when the deck is hot or when those probabilities are in your favor, you bet large, you take a big fat piece of cake and shove it into a deal. And then you wait, you, you suffer and endure, you build up, you'll build back up your bankroll. And you wait for the next deal. You don't look at every, you don't, you look at a lot of deals, but you don't execute on very many deals. Is that correct, Warner? And that is. So then the top, that segues into our next point, which is what happens when appreciation is more important than cash flow? What happens is what you just described, which is this thought process that everyone's in. I've got to be making money at every, every, every day. I got to be making, that's great if you're, if you're, doing regular income and you're an employee like you are in the Marine Corps. But if you're an investor, you will make, I mean, I want people to understand, understand this. You will make money every day if you do exactly what Mario's saying and you wait for the right deal that pays you cash flow. It's not about investing all the time to make money every day. It's about investing when the right deal at the right price with the right cash flow and the right margin safety comes along you execute on that deal, you will make money every day. Those are those those two points right there is the difference between putting appreciation first and cash flow first. What are your thoughts on that? Absolutely. Sit on 17 permanently. Be comfortable sitting on 17. Be very comfortable sitting with a good you got your you got your cards, you got 17. Let the dealer hit on 16. Sit on 17, folks. Um, that's gonna produce a better result than you always chasing the next hot thing. This, this cryptocurrency is irrational. It should be traded based on utility and not scarcity. There is no scarcity of tulip bulbs and there's no scarcity of Bitcoins. There's definitely no scarcity of digital coins, folks. This should be only traded based on the utility. I'm able to move dollars digitally from one person to another person and pay for something on a public ledger. I would say that the Federal Reserve, the United States Federal Reserve, for those folks listening in America, could come up with a digital currency and a private ledger and knock out a lot of these public ledgers. It'll be more efficient, and they have they have the ability to create dollars, which are used all over the world to buy commodities. Oil is still priced in dollars. So I, I would really caution folks that are investing right now in Bitcoin to or any digital currency to really underline the underlying economics should be based on utility and then if, if it's only utility which which currency is acceptable and what's the price of the currency and i'm going to go with one one of the three that are acceptable or the five or the ten that are very acceptable like the g20 countries and then what's the price of that currency and that can that do the job to buy oil to buy the things i need the things i want to invest in it's just a, it's just a store of value right at the end of the day that's all it is and now we want to do this digitally, which there's some there's some pros and cons to that. Uh, the public ledger, we're going to go into this. So we're going to have John Lillick on another podcast here. We're going to go into this public ledger and kind of break down that. But you know, the, the private ledger, public ledger, I think there's advantages to both. Uh, what are your thoughts on that, Warner? There's a multiple, multiple really, really good points. My thoughts on that are when you talked about a store of value, what's really important, and it's when we talked about inflation, it's really what it's it's really where you can use your money. Like say over here in Wyoming, okay, I have all this Bitcoin, where am I gonna use it? So I, I think people are they're thinking about this future euphoria and I get it why they're going over there. But like you said, with a business you thought out every ask marketing, sales, underlying economics of the business, management, all the things that you and I are going to go over in this podcast. Have you have you spent twenty years stacking up like you have, you and I have in different areas of this business and we come to together to go invest in these businesses? Have you spent the twenty to thirty years building up that knowledge and experience to do that? Have you done that with Bitcoin? Do you understand what Bitcoin's really about? Do you understand the blockchain? Do you understand how the technology works? Do you understand where it's accepted? Do you understand what companies are accepting it? Why did Elon Musk say he's not going to accept it? I would say that most people don't know jack about any of that. Yet they're 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 saying, "Oh, I'm going to invest in this. I'm going to put my money over here." 
yet they don't know the underlying fundamentals of the business. Your thoughts on that? Well, let's just neck it down real simple where you're exactly right. It's a store of value until you can actually make a real investment. It's not an investment. It's a store of value until you can go out and find a deal. So if you like gold, okay, there's some advantages to gold. Don't keep it in a bank because the banks will be closed when you actually need it, but it's a store of value. But you have a carrying cost. It costs you to store that gold. You need to secure it somewhere. You dig it out of the ground, you need to secure it back in the ground. Bitcoin doesn't pay you to hold it. Costs money to use it because of its energy. It costs, there's a transaction cost. So I'd say there's some advantages over gold and there's some disadvantages. There's no, there's no shortage of digital dollars, digital currency, bitcoins. There's no, there's no shortage. There's, there is some shortage in, in gold. There's a limited number of gold. So you can value gold based on its utility and its scarcity. You can only do one of the two in Bitcoin. It's just based on its utility. And then US dollars. Okay, there's there's more dollars than there was 100 years ago. Got it. There's going to be growth in M1 and M2, money supply. However, I get paid to hold dollars. I can get an interest rate on dollars. It's miserable. It's a miserable, it's a, I have to suffer and endure, but I'm getting paid to store my, the store of value to hold that value until I can find a deal. I'm getting paid a little interest every month until I can go out and find a deal and execute on it. That's kind of how I'm, I'm processing in my mind. Thoughts on that Warner? Yeah, those are, those are great points because what this all points back to is, is do you have a plan? Do you have measurable results, action items and timelines? Why do I bring that up? Because if you're an investor, your plan is to invest in high profit margin businesses that spin off cash. Okay, that's your goal, right? So you get, at 20, 30 years, you have all these business spin off cash. Well, you're going to take certain action items. Okay, so let's say, for example, you've made a million dollars, you've sold real estate, you sold some stocks, you bought them midway up, you sold them at the top. You're saying, hey, I want to take this cash out of these assets and save it for another event. When the market goes down and by my plan i want to invest in assets in the future that are a great price well how do you do that more how do you do that in the most efficient manner people don't think through this if i buy a block of gold okay i store it somewhere like you said protect it now if there's an asset trading at a great price well okay i'm gonna take that gold somewhere securely sell it to someone get the cash take the cash Put it in an account, buy the asset. Bitcoin, I'm going to go put my million dollars in Bitcoin. Is it going to be worth a million dollars in the future? Then I'm going to send it across an exchange. You used to do it with shady Russians. Now you can do it with you know whoever. I'm going to exchange that. How fast does it take to exchange that? What if they don't accept it? Then I'm transferring to this account. Then the government's coming after me. Then I'm going to this account. Then I'm going to that business. People don't think about that because they don't understand the final goal. They don't understand how to create wealth. If they understood at the core, it's about buying solid, high operating margin businesses. And then they looked at, that's my final goal. What actions do I take to get there in the most efficient manner? People don't do that. And that's why they get caught in all these Ponzi-like schemes and crazy ideas. And they wonder why they end up in 10 years, 20 years broke. Thoughts on that one? A little harsh. <laughs> Yeah, just to clarify, that was shady Russians. What I say? So just so we don't yeah, shady. Oh, I didn't know. Shady. I didn't say just the so, other just one. So we don't get, <laughs> yeah, just so we don't get censored here. That was shady <laughs> Russians. Yeah, you, de you definitely. Uh, I heard. I heard you talk about some guys going up into L.A. and having to try to sell some assets <laughs> to folks. <laughs> I shit. I'm like no, I'm out. So it comes out of game selection. As soon as you tell me the way to exit this thing is, I got to go up and meet some Russians <laughs> in L.A. I'm out, Warner. I'm out. Yeah, have you you know going along our lines of under evaluated business? Have you evaluated those Russians? Who are they dealing with? Do you are, do you, do you require firepower to go in there? What you know? What's the what's the game plan? I mean, there's so many unknowns that people don't even think about. At the end of the day, it's just so simple. Just wait for a high operating margin business in whatever realm: real estate, tech, however you can find it. Wait for it to go on a great sale and buy it. But everyone's just like, no, I got to make money now. I got to do this scheme. I got to do that scheme. They don't create a plan based on solid fundamentals of how they're going to grow their wealth. 
And if they create that plan, there would be actions that are concurrent with that. Instead, they just wing it. That's what most people are doing. They are. And if you really, if you walk through those steps and you created a plan with measurable results and timelines, and one of them was my exit strategy, Warner, is I got to go link up with some Russians in LA. Your response to me should be, okay, we're out. We're, that's, uh, we're going to circle back to that one. No, we're done here now. It's just, it's just ridiculous. Like when you, when you realize when there's an opportunity to buy a wonderful asset at a fair price and you've got to go scramble to sell some gold to somebody to get the cash to buy the asset or you got to scramble to sell the Bitcoin to get the cash, I'm going to be on the sidelines and Warner is going to be on the sidelines and we can execute faster because there's, there's, there's more efficiency. I don't have to sell anything. I'm already in the USD, which it's, it's, that's what people are selling. Really wonderful businesses in Central Oregon are selling in USD. They're, they're not selling in Bitcoin. They haven't priced their asset in Bitcoin. I don't know that the mom and pop owners want to sell their asset to us in bars of gold or Bitcoin. They, they know what U.S. dollars are worth, and they're comfortable taking those uh, when they sell their business. Well, let's let's land the plane and do the last uh, topic for tonight, which is number six. So, how do you become a subject matter expert on the game and its rules? My first initial thought is compete against average players, not against really smart players. So it's much better if you're going out there and you can find an area where there's, let's say, non-economic biases. There's people that don't like this kind of business or they don't like this area. Uh, they don't like Gillette, Wyoming. They don't like the underlying Gillette, Wyoming, and they just don't want to look at the deal. They're not interested in the deal. That's a semi non-economic bias. Divorce is a non-economic bias, not for the people going through it, but the underlying business that that family might be having to divest might be really sound and the price might be right, but there's a non-economic bias in there. They want to get rid of it because there's a divorce. I want to go out and compete against really average players. I don't want to compete against really, really bright players because they're going to do this. They have the same work ethic and they have the same intelligence or even greater intelligence. And they're going to do the work and they're going to know all the knowable information. And they're going to try to discover all the hidden information. When you're going into markets or areas where there's non economic biases and there's real average players competing in the space, we bring something to the table. Thoughts on that one. I'd like to define it even more. Because I think what we're, what we, the environment we really want to be competing in is obviously, yes, average players works in our advantage. But what we really want to be competing in is a psycholo psychologically demoralized, downtrodden environment where it, it, right. takes, it takes the high performing player down to an average player. Now, what do I mean by that? A high-performing player or a really smart guy, he could perform at an average level just because his psychology is not on point. It happens all the time. I'll give you a perfect example. There's Wayne Gretzky. I just bought a book of his today called, I think it was his 90 Lessons. And most people don't know this. A guy was describing it on a George Gammon podcast today, how Wayne Gretzky was not a phenomenal hockey player. He was just smarter than everyone else. Where did it's so funny that you just mentioned this? Where did Wayne Gretzky put himself on the ice? Do you know? He wanted to skate. So I'm an old hockey player from Seattle, and uh, this brings back a lot of memories of. Uh, he wanted to skate not to where the puck was, but where the puck was going to be. Put himself where no one else was. That's the key point. Yeah, where the puck was going to be, but where no one. The key point here is he put himself where no one else would go. That's how, that's what you and I are talking about. That's how he defeated. So you can, you can take phenomenal players and take them down to average. You can compete against phenomenal players by how you play the game, by operating environments they don't want to go in because they're phenomenal. So I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to one up you. I'm taking what you're saying to another level. You can take phenomenal players and you can bring them down to an average level by putting them in an environment that they're not used to being in. That's, that's a I skill concur. set of an investor that you and I are going to cultivate on this podcast. And the only way you cultivate that is what you're talking about on this podcast is you cultivate it through performance. And the only way you create performance is through persistent, consistent effort and practice over the long term. That's how performance is created. It's created like the Marine Corps, one building block at a time. It's boot camp. Then you lead a fire team. Then it's a squad. 
then it's a platoon. You're a subject matter expert in this area, and up it goes. And you do not get to each level until you prof- improve proficiency in the other levels. That's how you compete with a phenomenal player. You can go against average players, or you can bring phenomenal players into average environments, and you and you beat them by your consistent, persistent performance. And I'll let you close on that one. Yeah, the thought that came to my mind was a friend of mine who won the Abu Dhabi International Jiu-Jitsu competition for his weight class in his mid-30s. And I think he's like a purple belt. He's not a black belt. He's not a brown belt. He's like a mid-level belt. And I talked to him about how he won that tournament. He said it was really psychological. He said there was actually guys in my weight class that were better. He said that they were actually better at jiu-jitsu than he was technically the technical craft. But when you get into the ring, there's a psychological component and there's a little bit of, there's some techniques of, you know, maneuvering on an opponent and and causing some pain where you don't do that in practice. You would do that in competition. It's legal, but you're not doing that. You're not at a hundred percent in competition or in in practice. You're not going at a hundred percent, but in a competition, you're going a hundred percent and you can cause some, some strikes to to different parts of the body that are perfectly legal in competition, but you don't practice those in practice. And once you've experienced that, there's a psychological component of knowing that that's going to happen and enduring through the pain, which let's call him the horseman did. He won the whole tournament and it really came down. He said the component that, that made him win the international Abu Dhabi jiu-jitsu competition in his mid thirties was psycho- psychology. It wasn't technical expertise. So I, I concur on that note. You can be a, you can be an average player. You can take exceedingly great players and make them average. If you bring them into arena that they're not used to being in. Thank you for listening to the Red to Black podcast. We really appreciate you taking time out of your day to listen to our podcast. If you would like to connect with us in the future, you can find us on LinkedIn. Simply search for Werner Minchel or Mario Parzino. Also, you can find a link to our LinkedIn profiles in the profile section of the podcast. Thank you again for listening and we look forward to connecting with you in the future.